these conveniences. Thank God. All right. Okay, so I, as I said before, uh, welcome. I missed you all so much last week. Um, who knew electricity was so important to everything happening, you know? Um, but tonight, we are continuing with our Bible study, Matthew chapter 24. We are trying to figure out uh, what did Jesus have to say about the end times? And this is our, uh, I think our third round is going through with it, but that's okay. Um, I think every time we read the word, something new comes out. So for those who were with us last year when we did uh, Matthew 24, this might just be some um, ref uh, kind of reflection, you know, just additional but for you who didn't join us it's going to be an interesting ride so let's go uh, how are we going to go i'm going to go with reading the scripture praying and then we're going to dive straight into our bible study of course we are uh, last time we did um verses 1 to 14 tonight we do matthew 15 to 28 and let's read glory to god when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel the prophet stand in the holy place Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the house stop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. One to them that are with child, unto them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, O dear, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Father, we give you glory and honor and praises. And Lord, I just thank you for being able to spend a couple moments with your people on this blessed Wednesday night. This truly is the day that you have made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. And even as we come before you, Father, we come before you with humble hearts. We would just say, draw nigh to God and he would draw nigh to you. So we ask that you would draw near to us tonight, Father, as we spend time in your word. You alone know what you want to say to your people tonight. I pray that the words that I would speak would encourage, enlighten, inform your people. It would please you most of all. And Father, at the end of it, we will give you glory. I pray in a special way for anybody who is going through a really trying, difficult, challenging time. Anybody who feels like giving up. Anybody who is being, who feels like their back is against the wall. I pray, Father, for anybody who is really in a desperate state or place mentally tonight. I pray for strength in the inner man. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to fall and to Lord God comfort. I pray you would touch their minds give them the mind of christ your word that say you give peace which pass that all understanding give them peace now in the name of jesus father be a shield around them cover them under the blood i prefer anybody who's not feeling well in their physical body sickness and pain is not a nice thing to experience but father jesus your word says you would touch with all the feelings of our infirmities so we pray that by your spirit you would minister even now i pray for your people to draw on you to learn how to tap in and to rest in you tonight we ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's go. Uh, we'll just remind ourselves we are in Matthew chapter 24. This is called the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is indeed um, spending his last week with his disciples. And he begins to give them a picture of what is going to happen in the, the last days, the, the end of times. We'll remind ourselves that Jesus had just left the temple grounds and it was a massive, beautiful structure, grand in every way. And it was the pride and joy of the Jews as well. Herod had his own ulterior motives for constructing the building, but indeed it was a grand structure. And when Jesus gives them the news uh, in our last um, Bible study that is going to um, 
Every, no, he said specifically, there shall not one stone be left upon another. Now, there is a whole thought about um, them and particular pieces of the building. They did not use mortar. So indeed, when they, they put the stones on, it's like they fit each stone into the other. What they call it is an engineering marvel because of how huge the stones were, how perfectly they were cut. Um, it, uh, it still baffles the mind of many. How did they transport it? And how were they able to cut the pieces so carefully to say if you could even run something like a credit card? You could even run a credit card through them so tightly and beautifully they fit. Now, when indeed the Romans came, now let's remind ourselves of something. Historically, 40 years after Jesus gives them this speech, in fact, what Jesus did say happened, did happen, right? Um, I'll ask you, I have to want to ask you a question though. Um, last week, Wednesday, around one o'clock, um, electricity went at our home and I called, I called pastor, no electricity, I called Dave, no electricity, I called my sister, they have electricity, but they had generators, tried to contact with two or three other people, not, nothing. I want to ask a question. My question is, was anybody here warned that last week, Wednesday, electricity was going to go in the entire of Trinidad? Right, so I would say, what I found interesting was when electricity went, we got no water went, we had to be in buckets, the internet, we had no internet, we had no WhatsApp, Oh, and, and the thing is about it, you know, when electricity goes an hour too far, but you see when it comes to night and you have to, boil kettle and you know um plays hard mosquito you know, oh my goodness it it really was um a very interesting to me it was an eye opener to remind all of us indeed how we are so um dependent on modern conveniences what i also want to ask is this if somehow you were able to be warned that neck someone told you maybe uh, the day before a couple days before on Wednesday at one o'clock, electricity will go in all of Trinidad, water will go, the internet will go down. If you were warned before that was going to happen, would you have done things differently? I would assume some of us would go and find some sort of fan. Um, maybe some of us would have made sure we had batteries in our torch lights. Um, made sure if we have kerosene lamps, that you're, you're, yes, there are people still who have kerosene lamps, right? We still have, right? Uh, make sure that you had uh, fuel for that. Um, maybe if you had real finances, you could have made sure you had a generator or some sort of backup power. I mean, there are so many things you could have done to prepare, but we couldn't, we were not one and therefore we could not have. But if you could have, you would have, I'm sure a lot of us may have done things a little differently. Maybe you wouldn't have bought ice cream the week before. I mean, electricity going for so many hours, um, Brother Dave, put up an inverter and put it onto the fridge because we had um, stuff in there. You know, so my, my point is though, we didn't know what was going to happen. We were not prepared. And therefore when it caught us unaware, we were really in a position of being dependent on whatever we had around to make do. In this instance, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is telling them what is going to happen in the future. The first thing he says to them is something that shocks them because of course, they, at those days, the temple was actually, they said, um, would have been considered one of the modern marvels, wonders of the world. It was beautiful, it was grand, it was huge, and it was made with great um, expensive materials, right? There was a lot of gold in that temple, as you know, and, and I did the tabernacle with all of you, the, the, the candlestick, the table, all of this is pure gold, right? So now we see Jesus gives them a picture of what's going to happen. So about 30 something years later on, the Jews, of course, we know they, 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 the big thing was Jesus, are you going to liberate us from the Romans? Indeed, he didn't come for that. That was not his purpose. And, I, and like I said last time, they wanted physical liberation when the more important thing Jesus came to do was to give them spiritual liberation and they didn't see it. They rejected, basically they had in their mind what they wanted as a savior, as a redeemer, as a messiah. And when Jesus came and didn't fit into their mold, even though he fulfilled scripture and even though he did all those miracles and all of those things, they rejected him, right? And therefore they rebelled. And in AD 70, as Jesus said, the entire structure 
was completely demolished to the point now where no one knows for certain where exactly the location of the um, temple was on Temple Mount, right? And, and I showed you last time a picture of there was all remains now is indeed a couple big, huge um, boulders, well, cut out stone that fell, right? And it's uh, all the way down to the pavement on the, on the outside. Remember the, the Temple Mount is a, is a lifted area, right? So I'll send you some, I'll, I'll do some pictures for you, but what I want us to see what Jesus said happened. And now he begins to tell him some things that have happened. Now, for any of you who are following world news, you know that um, the Bible, what did Jesus say? He said in verse six, right? You shall, well, let me just, just refresh one thing. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and you shall be deceived. Now, what I want you to see in this chapter is indeed, it seems like there is a progression. Tonight, as when we go into it, we'll see we, we're going to be smack middle in the tribulation. But for the first 14 verses or so, this is events preceding the tribulation, the rapture of the church, right? We know the next big thing that's going to happen to all of us is the church is going to be raptured, the seven years tribulation, at the end of that, the second coming of Christ, right? We remind ourselves that we are in the um, end times and Jesus gives some warning. Now, what I want us to see is this. All of these things that Jesus talks about, wars, rumors of wars, nation run against kingdom, king, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places, all of these things have been happening from time immemorial on earth. But what we have to look out for and what should put up our little antennas and to be more aware is this. When it becomes a global thing where a lot of rumors of wars, right now we heard this whole thing about um, China, we know about Iran. Now we hear that war is looming between Russia and the Ukraine. We will only see what happens. It, the, the, everything I've seen, they say it's going to happen soon. And if, if so, in our lifetime, well, that is us who are, old, young, 40s or so-ish, that would be the first major war that happens. Now, remember, I, I had given you some stats about wars, the amount of wars that are currently going on. That's not the only one, but it will be, if you, you see what's happening is the world leaders and um, the American president, they're meeting with him, asking him to, to put it off and, and, and they're going to start to do sanctions and we'll see how it goes. If it, if it does break out now, we see, indeed, like I said, what we have to look at is, is everything getting, is it, is it everything on a global scale increasing? So is wars, in, uh, wars increasing, rumors of wars increasing? For sure, I can see. And, and next time, two things I want to discuss next week is the whole Shemitah year and the um, year of rest and also um, Petra, right? We'll try to do it next time, but nation against kingdom, kingdom against kingdom, all right, famines increase. Our famines increasing globally. Our pestilence is increasing globally. Earthquakes in diverse places. Now, I want us to also remind you of something. Verse eight says, "All these are the beginning of sorrows." And we'll just remind ourselves, as a, when a mother is having a child, as she gets closer to having this baby, the birth pains will get stronger and stronger, more frequent. So that is exactly how we believe it will pan out. Now, let's go straight into verse fifteen. He says, "Now." Right, I think I probably have two or three slides, brother Dave, and then we'll go straight into it. But verse, verse 15, right, the last thing he said is verse 14. Gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. Now, verse, right, so first slide, brother Dave. Right. So I, I, got, I found a statistic on um, it's Bank My Cell. It's a, it's a blog. And they said, how, my question was, how many cell phones are in the world? Now, verse 14 says, gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness. Do you know right now that 83.89% of people in the world have a smartphone? Right, which it, it equals to 6.64 billion. And listen, right, this calculator... As I was doing it, the numbers just kept, it literally was kept trying to kind of keep a, a track of how many people, people, I mean, the amount, the, number, the numbers just kept increasing, increasing, increasing. I'm sure if I go um, this week, I will see even increased numbers. So we see here um, something very interesting in that while they are, everybody has a cell phone now, y'all, 
all sorts of ages. And now with this whole glo this pandemic, we literally can't function without some sort of device to be able to use the internet and to be able to use social media to get our information, right? So what I want you to see is we are much closer to that. Now, there are some people who, who don't believe that um, that was specifically means the gospel has to go to every single person in all world, but we will see how that goes. What I, my point is though, there are so many smartphones and there, there, there's so much gospel out there, right? I, I just want to make a plug for this. If you are on social media and you have a presence and you post things, I want to encourage you to be, uh, you are in a great position to spread the gospel. Right, it's not only um, pastors or preachers or teachers. You are in a position where you can post something. I'll start with this: be a basic thing. WhatsApp. You know, every single day, I want you to put up status on your WhatsApp. If you do, if you don't know how to do it, ask somebody, and you find an encouraging text about Jesus. I want you to become a great evangelist for the Lord. That doesn't mean you have to go on and stand up in a church. This. The entire, everything is changing. And, and I feel the people that you have who are your friends, who are, um, you know, and even on Facebook, find encouraging things. And every day, you, you know how to use TikTok, make a nice, I saw this little girl, you know what she did? I can't say if it's on YouTube, it's a call a short. Anyway, and all she did was um, speak, uh, point a scripture and came up above her head and she just wrote a little scripture. Anything you know to do to spread the gospel, I want to encourage you, you or your children, especially your children. You know, there is so much out there and I want you to, all of us to get to, into the habit of using our technology. If we know how to use it, if we know how to post something on Facebook, post something on, um, even on WhatsApp, you know, you could send forwards to your friends. Now, some people get annoyed if you send them too much, right? So don't send them like 10 or 20 per day, maybe one per day, one per week, right? Pace yourself. But what I want to encourage you to do is to be a great evangelist. And that will come by you purposefully every single day. Even if you find a nice script, just start posting it. And people, you know, people literally go through stuff, lots of stuff. One thing that you might say might draw them to Christ. Next slide. Right, so now we're gonna go, verse 15. This now is abomination. Now he says, therefore, Jesus is speaking. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Now I will explain that to you in a minute. Now in brackets, it says, whoever reads, let him understand. Um, what uh, Bible scholar says, this is not Jesus's words. This is the words of the Ma Matthew. And he's saying, pay great attention. You need to figure out what is happening. What is happening in Daniel? Now, Jesus quotes Daniel, right? So but by one way, he verifies it was a prophet. Daniel was indeed a prophet. Daniel, the book of Daniel is actually called the revelation of the Old Testament, right? One day, if we get brave enough, we'll do that book, right? So let's go into what is the abomination of desolation. I'll remind you, abomination is something that is decent it's detestable it's disgusting in the eyes of a particular people right so now for the next couple of verses you will see things that apply and would stand out to jews now like i said in verse 15 it seems like we have made a fast forward into the tribulation right so we make the fast forward. Daniel speaks about something that's going to happen midway of the tribulation. The tribulation, of course, we know is seven years of God's wrath being poured on earth, poured out on earth in a manner and a fashion that was has never been, right? So anything you've ever seen before, any document, any historical stuff you saw for tragedy or drama or disaster, not, that can't touch what is going to happen, right? So we see abomination of that. Something is going to happen that is so horrible that the Jews now are just going to scatter. Go ahead. Good. So let's read now. So he says, Prophet Daniel. So I'm going to show you the scriptures that were in Daniel. It says, right, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. I'll read quickly. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So indeed, this is all pointing towards the second coming of Christ. But of course, um, certain things have to be accomplished first. He says, no, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, three score, two weeks. We discussed that last year. The street shall be built again, the war and even troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
and the end thereafter be with a flood and unto the end war desolations are determined, right? And he shall confirm the covenant for many. For one week, the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, the overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate, right? So now I'll give you a, a, a snapshot into what's happening. We know in AD 70, the temple, Herod's temple, the, the Jewish place of worship was destroyed. So therefore, also, I, I heard someone say this, and I say, you know, it, 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 he had a point. He said that there is there at Jesus's, when Jesus died, the need for animal sacrifice ended. It ended, and therefore, indeed, 40 years after um, Jesus died and all of that went to heaven, the temple was destroyed. And since then, the Jews have not been able to sacrifice in a temple. They don't have a temple. They have synagogues now, small places of worship, but they don't have a temple. And they all, the very um, religious ones, are Czech Jewish Temple Institute. You can do research on that if you want. They are all waiting for their temple to be rebuilt, right? Now, it's a lot for you to take in, but here, let's say like this. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, it appears as if he will help them. Now, of course, we know on the Temple Mount that, that is ad, um, administratively managed by the, the Muslims, and they have um, their, their special holy site there. And therefore, there is no space, there is no space for a Jewish tabernacle or temple to be built. But of course, the Jews hold to the fact that that location is where their temple tabernacle was the te temple was built and therefore it has to be there so we will see how it goes but basically what's going to happen is this the antichrist is going to come on the scene he is going now as you see there's roars and rumors of wars that's taking place right now but he will bring in peace on a, on a level and a scale that world has never seen before he will help the jews we believe that he will help the jews rebuild their temple location unknown yet but the Jew, apparently the Jews will be completely and totally duped by the Antichrist. He will be a charismatic leader. Now, in the midst of the week, now I already explained to you the weeks really mean um, years, seven years, right? We already know that. So in the midst of it, which is really um, at the three and a half year point, he will come into the tabernacle and declare that he is the person to be worshipped, that he is God and he expects all of them to worship him. At this point in time, though, he would be so powerful. He would have um, reign, government reign. He will have so much um, clout, as they say, they would not be able to say, we won't worship you. Of course, we know the Jews only worship the one and only unseen God. So basically it is an abomination. It is something detestable. He will come in, he was in, in their tabernacle at the three and a half year point and say, I am God, worship me. If you don't worship me, pressure. No, his plan is to completely, and has always been the enemy's plan to destroy Israel and kill all the Jews, right? That's his plan. Next slide. Right. So in Daniel 11, 13, it says they are actually, uh, four instances where it's mentioned his arm shall stand they shall pollute the sanctuary take away the daily sacrifice so now uh, the, the, i want you to imagine in your mind we are in the tribulation halfway point the temple is rebuilt they're doing the daily sacrifices and they shall take the place of abomination and make it desolate right from the time of the daily sacrifice daniel 12 11 from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate is set up there shall be 1,290 days. Somebody check that and tell me how much that is, right? Good. Now, you remember I mentioned that if we look at the, the, the Gospels, we look at the Epistles, we look at the Book of Revelation, and we look at the Prophets, there is no way um, we can understand the Book of Revelation without the Old Testament, right? So now we're looking at the Epistles, and here's what um, Paul says. He says, let no in second Thessalonians 2 3 and 4 it is so beautiful to see how scripture supports scripture and scripture helps you if you you really do your research it, it supports and helps you have a greater understanding when you begin to see how much this thing is intertwined and interconnected 
He says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The man of sin is revealed, the Antichrist, the son of perdition. Right? So here what it says, he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So we see here very clearly he, what he's going to do will be is already being told to us. Right. So Jesus tells us now exactly what's going to happen. And he confirms what Daniel says. He will all of his worship. So he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. And you, you let's just imagine we, we live in a we live in a world now where. You know, there was a point in time I taught the greater ability to access biblical knowledge and books would help but we know we live in a time and a season and jesus did say certain things would happen he said iniquity the love of many shall wax cold and there's a lot of things the coldness of man and christians there was lots of um coldness and a lot of stuff creeping into the church the world creeping into the church all of that but we'll see here you and I, if I were to ask you now, if you would ever worship a man, that is a, a horrible thing. But do you know there are lots of people now who follow people on um, the social media, or even they have, they're such a fan of this person, it's almost like they're completely obsessed and totally taken over by this person who has a gift or a talent and ability, right? And if I were to ask you right now, if you would ever worship a man, you would say no. But do you know right now, all over the world, there are people who claim to be Jesus Christ. Do up a little search on Google and say there anybody right now who claims to be Jesus. There are people right now. You know, one, my, my thoughts are, you know, somebody deluded, let them be deluded. But the scary piece is people are following them. There are people, not everybody, not masses, but there are people, they all have a following, right? So when Jesus says, don't be deceived, we have to be very careful, right? So let's finish verse four. All that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God. Like I said, he, he now comes in and says, I am God. You have to worship me. And we will see that the false prophet who will be his right-hand body will be able to perform signs and wonders. And we know people love signs and wonders. So therefore, if, it have, if he could commit um, a sign or a wonder, uh -huh, is he, that is God. That must be God. Mm -mm, not at all. Good. Verse 16, he says now, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, interesting um, fact, I'll let us know. We are all, we all live in Trinidad and Tobago. And if there were to ever be a disaster, you and I would not be able to flee to any mountain, right? There's, that is not part of our geography. That is not part, that is not our, um, that is, that is not in the cards for us if a disaster takes place. Go outside and stand up outside your house and watch it, but there's no way, go to, there is no way we have any mountains to flee to. But so, the, so in our minds, that is a hard thing for you to comprehend. So I'm gonna just show you something very brief to kind of give you an idea. I will post a video on Facebook of the geography of Israel. And so you will see it is indeed what it's called. Let's see what it says. It says it is, it has, it has forested highlands, green valleys, mountainous deserts. We know David at one point in time hid the coastal plains and the Dead Sea. Now, of course, um, Dead Sea is in Israel and it actually is the lowest place on planet Earth, right? So it says here there are four geographical regions. It's mostly dry, it's coastal plains, mountain range, hills and valleys and desert, plus the Kinneret and Jordan River. Good. So, you, right. So let's see. I just want to tell you some brief facts about Israel because it's kind of important for us to, I know for you, most of you who follow these things, it's, it's, it's new, it's not new stuff, but for anybody who doesn't understand, since AD 70, right, remember the temple is destroyed, the Jewish people now is massacred, some, they say the, the people, they starved them. So a lot of them died inside the city before they even got in. When the Romans get in, they do mass killings. Whoever survived now, what they said is they sold them as slaves and sent them to be, of course, we know it is a horrible thing to think about, but it was sport to go into arenas and see animal kill. I got to tell you, that was some sort of barbaric generation. I hope never comes back, but it was sport to see people be killed by animals, right? So in May of 1948, Israel was officially declared an independent state. So this is for us to understand. Since 
80, 70, the Jews, but the Jews live there. They, 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 of course, were under the Romans. There has been no point in time where the Jewish people were able to reclaim their land. Since then, I will get a map for you. You will see um, the, the ownership of Israel change, 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 change to the point where, you know, they don't own it now. But in 1948, a miracle took place and they were officially declared an independent state. Following the announcement, right, five Arab nations, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, and Syria, and Lebanon immediately invaded their region. And that was became known as the 1948 Arab-Israeli war. And the sixth day, now, they were able to, to get most of Israel, but there was a piece they weren't able to. So in 1967, <laughs> when I show you that map, I'll show you something just now, right? Uh, and what started as a surprise attack, Israel in 1967 defeated Egypt, Jordan, and Syria in six days. After this brief war, Israel took control of the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. These areas were now considered occupied by Israel, right? So Israel, basically, after the Six-Day War, doubled its land. Of course, we know there was a particular minister who gave them, even though every, the Temple Mount was, still does belong to Israel, they gave the, the Muslims administrative control over the Temple Mount, and that is a contentious thing right there. Right, last two more facts I'll let you know. Israel is the only country in the world that has the same name, is located in the same land, and speaks the same language as it did 3,000 years ago. Right, since the formation of the PLO in 1964, its leader Yasser Arafat repeatedly stated his goal was to completely eliminate the state of Israel. Following uh, him, the leaders of Hezbollah and Hamas in Palestine, along with the Iranian president, continued with the same aim. Their aim is to destroy Israel entirely, right? I'll just tell us this, right? Look at this map now, carefully, right? So you see my source, but I want you to see, right? Um, there are coastal plains, there's hills, there's a desert area. The, the geography of um, Israel is amazing, but I want you to see how small Israel is. I, I should have put it on a global map. Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, they are surrounded by hostile neighbors. And if you look at the size of their, their, how could one small little nation come against all these big nations and win? That's something for us to think about, right? But what I want to see if God has something planned and he, he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And the, and the enemy, no matter, and this is what I want you to see. The enemy is not on the same, you know, the, 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 he's not on the same plane with God. This is like God is fighting this battle with the devil here. It's like God is, he is indeed in control and real the enemy. All I wanted to, if my hand is here, imagine all the way down, 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 down to the dead seed. That is how far, and he's small, 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 and God is huge, huge, huge. Don't get into the, the, the mindset that the enemy is this. I mean, he is indeed a force to be reckoned with, but he can't compare to God. And I, I'll say this again. If God has something in store for you, it doesn't matter how big the people around you, how, how, how much position, how much management authority, how much whatever they have on the outside. If God says it's going to happen, he will cause it to happen. I just, the, the, the part for us to do is to, to stand still and see the salvation of God. Whatever God has for you will come to pass. And maybe somebody might try to delay it for a while, but you keep in prayer and you keep fasting and you keep believing and God will cause it to come to pass. I also want you to remember, we will all face giants in our lives. There is nobody that's not going to face a mountain or a giant. Right, there, we will all face some sort of mountain or giant in life. Some of us have more mountains to climb over. Some of us have huger giants. But the point is, though, if God is on your side, who can be against you? He says very clearly in His Word, "What is impossible with man is possible with God." We learned a couple of weeks ago as well that for some of us, suffering might be a portion, but suffering indeed has a purifying effect on us. Next slide. Good. So now he says here in verse 16, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, right? So remember, I just told you there's a, um, the, the geography, of, there's a whole hilly part of it, right? So I want you to look at my map. I want you to locate Jerusalem. It's in red. And, and to the bottom of Jerusalem, to your left, what do you see there? Judea. So this whole area, right? What I want to see in your mind, this is not an, an, in Trinidad or anything. Good. Next. Revelation 12, 6 says, and a woman, Israel, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she might be nourished for 1,000, 
260 days. So we know what, what we believe will happen and will pan out is this, at the midpoint, now of course we know that the Jews have always been a people who have been very faithful to serve their one God. And they're, they're, they're of course, um, there's always a, a side that will wish to be idols and be unfaithful to God, but there's always a remnant. It is apparent that when Israel realizes that they've been doomed by the Antichrist, they will reject him. And the Antichrist now will pursue them and his attempt will be to kill all of them. And he will, um, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says two thirds of all the Jews will be killed. We don't know, um, I'll, I'll read that scripture for you and see how you interpret it. And, and, and I'll stop right there and tell you this. I don't want you to accept anything I tell you as I, I am promising you that my theology may not always be 100% right. I am trying my best. I use my sources, but indeed I, I consult maybe, maybe two or three times. So I want you to not say, well, Sister Cindy, Reverend Cindy said this, so therefore that is it. I want you to get the Bible for yourself. I want you to get your concordance, your Bible dictionary and do your research yourself. But what I want you to see when the, um, Antichrist sets up his real motive will be revealed. His aim is to mash up Israel, kill all the Jews. But God will preserve a remnant. God always preserves a remnant, right? Good. Verse 17. Now we begin to see. Now, if, if you read this and I'll turn it out, let's read it. Verse 17, I'll tell you. Let him who is on the house top not go down to take anything out of his house. Now, you and I don't have a house top. We don't have a house top. Anybody here has a house top you can actually access? I would say 99% of us do not. But in those days, the way their houses were constructed, um, the, the top of their house, they actually could use it as an actual floor in terms of um, what they said, they, they use it for um, relaxation, for doing certain things. Um, right, they said it was, it was flat and used as an outdoor living space. Someone could easily jump down from a low roof or run roofed up to roofed up to move quickly through the city and rather go down to houses to belong in. So the first thing is if you're home, right? You know, um, last week, last week, Wednesday, wherever you were, if you were home, you know, there was no point, there was no, there was a good, it was a good thing to be home. Pastor gave you all her, um, her testimony of, she just pulled in when the uh, electricity went and if if she had if five minutes later she would have been locked out of the property right so what he's saying you, you when you see this happen start running <laughs> right you know um i, I might tell you we had an earthquake and when the earthquake started, we went under the table and then um, Dave said, come out of the house. And then we all went outside the house. You know, when, when emergency takes, when things happen in emergency and you don't have a plan in your mind and you know, you're, you're, you're scared and you're panicking, you do well, not too smart things, right? But Jesus has given him a specific warning. So this is for the Jews now because he, the Antichrist, he go, he's going to go straight for them now. He says, he was on the house of your home, don't even go down. So basically on top of your house, you, be, you see this happen. I assume it will be on social media. That is my thought. I don't know exactly yet. You see this, this Antichrist go. He, he goes into the temple. He says, he is God. Worship me as God. Start running because something is going to happen. He's going now to try to kill all the Jews, right? So if you're home, don't even go downstairs to get anything. Start to run, right? Verse 18 now. Him who is, so if you're at work now, he said, let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes, right? Of course, we don't work in fields now, but I, I would you like you to like it as if in your, they're in a job or wherever they are, don't go back home, right? So you, uh, you just, it is, why is it so urgent to flee though? It's so urgent to flee because it literally seems like the enemy has, the Antichrist already has his plan. I don't know if he's going to use a nuclear um, weapon, what he's going to use, but it seems like whatever he's going to use is going to be very effective. It's going to kill a lot of Jews. And if they don't follow Jesus' instructions, they will all die. That said, I'll just remind us of something, an interesting fact I read. He said, you know, um, Jesus, when he gave this warning, um, it's believed that many Christians, right? It says that um, men, when the, the, the war started with, with Rome and the, the, the Jews rebelled and Jerusalem was in um, danger and all of that, it says that in AD 60, many Christians abandoned the city halfway through the siege. So they, it's believed that they kind of took that literally and we remind ourselves of something, right? There, while we, we hold to the belief that 
the end of times has not happened yet. You know, there's a whole group of people who believe that we live in the millennium now. There's a group of people that believe that all of this has happened already. Now, I'll just tell you some interesting facts. You know, I love the whole historical facts, right? There was a guy by the name of Ante Antiochus. He was very, he came to power in 174 BC. The, the reason I want to tell you this one story is this. There are a lot of people who said all of these things happened already. We don't believe so. What I believe, is, remember what I said about the Old Testament? It's a type and a shadow. So something happened, but indeed that was just a, 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 a shadow, a type of it. But now the real thing is yet to happen. What he did, he did some very horrible things. And um, he... When he, he hated the Jews, by the way, because um, he called himself Epiphanes, which means God manifest. The, the Jews called him Epiphanes, which is the mad one, right? So it says now he, he, he wanted all of the Jews to become um, Greeks, to, to convert them to his culture. And, and anybody who refuses to submit, he slaughtered them. What do you think he did in the temple? Of course, we know that um, he took, he sacrificed, he set up a statue in the tabernacle in the temple and he sacrificed a pig. And it's some people say he made the priest drink the blood, but basically he sacrificed a pig on the altar. And therefore there, that was one time where there was indeed an abomination taking place, right? Good. Where are we? First 18. Let him who is in the field not go back. So basically Jesus is saying, wherever you are, get out, start running. Where are you going? To the hills. Right. Like I said, I want you to look at the video I'll post that because I want you to see how Israel, it's not like Trinidad, there's lots of hilly places. And indeed, um, we know that David did some hiding in, in some of those hills as well. Right. Verse 19. Go, let those, go to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. So my question would be, what are the special features of people who are pregnant or nursing? Of course, the special feature would be they would be slow in terms of being able to run, you know, um, you ever try to run with a baby in your hand? That is very, very hard. I, it amazes me. Every single time I go to a sports day and they have a parent and child race, the, some parent always falls down. I don't know if you've ever been to a sports day like that. The parent and the child is always a parent that falls down, right? Of course, we know if you're pregnant, you can't, certainly can't run. What was Jesus? Says? He says in verse 16, let them which be in Judea flee. Flee means very quickly start running, right? So he, he, now he begins to highlight those who will be um, disadvantaged, right? So, so it's a real challenge. Even now, for those of us who live in this day, you know, um, yes, I've, I've spoken to people who said, way hey boy, it's a, I don't think it's a good time right now to have a baby or have a child because, of course, we know you have to go into the hospital and interact with so much people, right? So basically, the, what makes this group of people um, especially you know, um, difficult to, to follow this instruction would be, they will be slow. And if you have a baby, you know, it's a different thing. If you're a crying baby, a ball, you know, you have a whole different bundle of stuff to deal with. If you have to move fast and then have to be able to have food for this baby, wow. Thank God we won't be here for that because of course we all know if we are in the tribulation from verse 15, we, the church has already been raptured. Good, verse 20. He says, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. What, winter was not a good time to travel in Israel because the roads are very muddy and rough. That is why kings of old waited until spring to go to war. Plus, the hill country of Israel gets cold. So Jesus begins, to see, now remember, he says, no one knows um, the time, the day or the hour, but who his father. So Jesus didn't know. So he's just telling them, for those of us now, if it's winter, pressure, Sabbath now. The Sabbath is an interesting one. And the Sabbath, you know, you know, the Jews had this whole, they had all these little rules. And they, there is literally a distance, a maximum distance you could travel on the Sabbath, right? So now they wouldn't be able to meet. And remember, if you're a Jew, of course, you, you know, um, there's a whole thought of, you know, from the, from this, this Sabbath, it, there's probably, there's, there's someone that says even in Israel, in certain places, there's no even public transport available on the Sabbath on certain days, right? Also, um, they say it would make large groups of Jewish people who normally avoid activity easier to spot. So now he's saying, pray and not have to do it. And the Sabbath, of course, we know Sabbath starts on, 
um, the six in the evening to six the next day. Prayer doesn't have to be in that time because if you have to run, therefore you have to really ignore your own beliefs about moving because of course, like I said, they could only move a certain amount of distance on the Sabbath um, legally according to their rules. Good. Now, verse 21, Jesus says, for then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor shall there ever be. So what kind of tribulation? We see there's a clear distinction, a great tribulation. So we see now this great tribulation, last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation, it seems like everything is going to ramp up. And it says, whatever disaster you have ever seen or read about in history, that you have not seen anything like what is coming. Of course, like again, I want to remind us the church will not be here on planet Earth at this point in time because this is in the midst of the tribulation. And we know that the next great big thing for the church is the rapture, right? Has that kind of tribulation ever hit planet Earth? No. And if you think about the amount of atrocities that have taken place on planet or the amount of people have been wrongfully killed, taken advantage of right now, there are millions of our brothers and sisters in jail, persecuted, starved to death, treated bad, house burned down, family killed, all sorts of bad things happen. And it's going to be worse than that for sure, for sure, Brother Dave. I don't want to be here at all, <laughs> at, 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 at all. I don't want to even think about thinking about being here, right? But we see here, Jesus is giving them a warning. When, so the Jews, now remember, the Jews do not accept Jesus as well. Of course, we know they are Messianic Jews and they are Jews of come to Christ, but as a general people, they do not and have not accepted Jesus as Lord. So now I would think, if somebody has access to the, 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 um, our Bible, they will be able to tell them these particular things. Jesus said it will happen, it happened in verse 22. Good, he said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect, the elect, we believe they're talking about, it. now in the Bible, um, there are different groups that have been re referred to as the elect. One group, of course, is the church, and one group, of course, is the Jewish people. We believe in this instance, it's um, speaking about the Jewish people because we know um, while the church age is going on now, the, the focus is indeed uh, on the Gentile world, but we know when the, the tribulation takes place, um, remember I said it's, it's a wake up and a shake up, right? I heard this preacher say that it was so good. It's to, it's to wake up the world and to shake up the Jewish people, to open their eyes to see what they have been denying for so long is true and is real, right? So why did Jesus admonish the disciples the days would be shortened? Why do you think? Of course, we see here indeed it is uh, because planet Earth and people on planet Earth can't take so much disaster that nobody would remain, right? So what would happen if the doors would not be shortened? Therefore, he says, Unless the days be short, no flesh will be saved. Indeed, everybody will die. And indeed, we know it's a seven year. Um, the time already has been set. Seven years. No more, no less. It was 23. Now, during, while, um, what I want us to remember is this. Remember I spoke about there are people who will claim to be Christ. There, will pe there are people who will come to deceive us. There were people who will claim to be followers of Christ and still come to deceive, right? So, so he says, if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, oh dear, do not believe it, right? Um, who do we believe when claims are made that people have seen Christ? We believe, no, we don't believe those claims, right? Like I say, there are people who may have signs or wonders, but we do not believe people. And, you know, um, we just have to be very careful that not everybody who claims to be followers of Christ are followers of Christ, right? Not everybody, we, we read and we will read about signs and wonders and all of these things will will be able to dupe people the enemy has a certain level of power too right and therefore you really have to test the spirits and see when people say certain things if they are followers of christ if their lifestyle is ca characterizes holiness also if they are true christians are devoted disciples of christ are they such right a true christian in my opinion is a devoted disciple of Christ, right? We, we all start off as babies, but begin as we spend more time in the world, we begin to be strengthened and begin to mature. Verse 24. For 
false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. And we'll stop there. We are people who are so led by what we see. Now, I am not saying you have eyes. Why does God give you eyes if he didn't expect you to use your eyes and see stuff? But what I want you to do is this. He, Jesus is giving us warnings. Like I said, there are people who claim to be followers of Christ, but indeed have come on the scene to deceive God's people. If anybody asks you to do anything that is against the Bible, they are not true followers of Christ. There is no new additional revelation. What Jesus need to, needed to say to us has been said in the word already. And if anybody adds, you know, remember the book of Revelation, those who add or those who take out, we have to be very careful on how we will not be deceived. The question is, right? He said, false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. So that's something for us to be aware of. People, there will be false people who will claim to be Christ, false prophets who will do great things and people will be fooled, right? And it says, if possible to deceive the very elect. The elect are the ones who are chosen, the called out ones. So imagine, you know, imagine the people who are literally God's people who are already followers of Christ are in jeopardy as well. What about the person who just so lost in their own world and their own life that they know anything about Jesus? They be completely and totally deceived. You have never met, have you ever met anybody who, who is, um, has a different thought than you and you know what you're saying is right and they know what they're saying is right and you can't convince them otherwise? completely and totally deceived. Verse 25. Good. He says, I have told you beforehand, right? So when we read about all of these things, now remember I said, what we have to look for is these things have been happening since we know human history. Imagine the first two children on earth. The first two children on earth couldn't live in peace. It's not like they had neighbors to play with or anybody. The first two children on earth, one brother killed the other brother. So we know uh, just in our nature to be, to war, to, to be, have strife, to, 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 to be selfish, all of those things, right? It is in our nature. But um, what I want us to see as well is Jesus tells us certain things here. He says, Wars, rumors of wars, is, it was anybody, especially when the pandemic now had wonder if, if Jesus coming anytime soon. Anybody heard anybody say that Jesus, he says, somebody said Jesus coming this year. I heard a talk about that already, right? Please be careful about listening to people who set dates and times. I, I, I think it's a season and, and I will go into that a little more detail, but I want you to see that Jesus highlights the point that he is the true prophet and he is. And what he says will come to pass. And all we have to do is judge and say, okay, so Jesus said one, two, three, four. Has one, two, three, four happened? It will, it must. We serve the true and the living God, the God who is in the past, he's in the present, and he knows the future. There's nothing that's hidden from him. There's nothing he doesn't know. So my question to you after we read this book, he says, see, I have told you beforehand, what does Jesus know? Everything. And Jesus says, a true prophet, verse 26, almost there. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out, or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not go out. My question to you would be, why would people want to lead others astray? Of course, we know there's a whole group of people who are followers of Satan, and therefore their intention is to lead as much people astray as possible, because we know that if you aren't living, your heart is not right with God. If, if your, your human life on earth ends, and your heart is not right with God, you will spend a Christless eternity. And that is a serious thing to think about and even talk about, right? But basically Jesus is saying now the people will come and people will, they will begin to say he's here, he's there. And because people looking for miraculous, looking, wanting the miraculous and thinking the miraculous is, must only be linked to God, they will go looking. Don't do that, verse 27. Right. So as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the son of man be. So this is very clearly Jesus telling us about his second coming. Remember, um, the, the first thing is Jesus will come in the clouds and he will take his saints. Right. 
he will take the those who are alive and those who went on before that will be the, that that will be the rapture now this the second coming of christ at the end of the seven years now jesus comes back and he says here so where does the lightning come from the sky so it's very visible you can't really hide lightning right and the question is is this the second coming of christ yes it's the second coming of christ verse 28 We'll end with this one. He says, wherever the carcass is, the other eagles or vultures will be guarded. My question is, why do vultures gather in one place? For all of us who live in Trinidad, you must know when you see a set of vultures gathering in the sky, what happens? You must know something is dead, right? So, so of course, this is speaking about uh, a big war that's going to take place and lots of people will die. And therefore, it says... Um, there's a little discrepancy some people say in terms of eagles and vultures but basically these birds of the air will come to feed on the dead flesh and my question to you was why vultures gather they gather because they come you can't hide a fallen body he says especially in the open right jesus said it'll be obvious to everyone good what does god know everything i want to encourage you tonight we, we're ending now God knows everything. There's nothing that God doesn't know. There's nothing that you're going through that he doesn't feel, that he doesn't understand. We know that everything is for a time and it's for a season. So you really encourage yourself to know that you serve the God who knows the past, he knows the present, and he knows the future. For some reason, he allowed you to be alive right now on planet Earth, and he still wants you to be an overcomer and a conqueror. So go to bed tonight with the knowledge that the God that you serve knows everything. Good. How to respond to Jesus' promises? One, Jesus can be trusted because his promises, prophecies come true, right? Jesus can be trusted. And your trust seems like such a simple thing, yet when things happen, we doubt God. It is very human to doubt God. But God wants to be our most trusted friend. He wants us to be the people who completely and totally trust in him, right? So we remind ourselves also that Jesus gave prophecies and the prophecies at that point in time in the beginning of Matthew 24 didn't come true, but they have some of them have come true and some remain to come true yet, right? But we remind ourselves, we serve the God who is the God of the past, the present and the future. He was, is and is to come. So therefore we can be completely Go to sleep to bed completely in, at peace knowing our God is in control and un, in charge. Let's go. Tell somebody, one body, anybody, everybody about Jesus. And I, I think I just want to remind us that you have a great platform with your smartphone to reach people for Jesus. So in every single social media platform that you are able and capable to post things every day, I want to encourage you to post something about Jesus. I also want to remind you that if you have children, if you have nieces, any, the next generation that, that is under you or below you, it is very important that we get them to the point of loving Jesus, and wanting to serve Jesus, reading their Bible, doing things that will draw them close to Christ. Remember what, what our aim is? To become devoted disciples of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come before your presence one more time through the blood of your son, Jesus. I thank you for your people who joined us tonight. I thank you for the place that they are in their homes, wherever they are. I pray you would continue to minister into their, their lives even now. Father, the world, our country, our families, we are going through a global pandemic that has literally thrown some of our worlds upside down there's so much uncertainty around us but we are certain that you are the god who's always in control and in charge jesus you already told us all of these things will begin to happen on a greater and greater scale as time proceeds closer to the the time of the rapture and the tribulation and the second coming of christ so father as we look around and we we don't always understand we don't know the future you know we just ask that you would strengthen us to be able to cope with whatever has happened, is happening, and is going to happen. We know you are, and we can be completely confident in you and the word of God that it is true. That you never lie. You can't lie. It's impossible for you to do that. So if you say that you will be our strength and you will give us a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind, Father, we don't depend on our feelings. We depend on you and your word. So we pray that by your spirit, we would, Father, be delivered from all you mean for us to be delivered from and that we would be great 
disciples of Christ and great evangelists for Christ. Even though as we end tonight and we, we meet next week Wednesday, I pray your hedge of protection be around your people. I pray for provision for those who are in need that you would open doors and make ways. I pray that for comfort for those, Lord God, who have lost loved ones and who are still in many, their mind is in so much places of grief and, and all of these things. I pray you would comfort. I pray for those in a special who are really just dealing with all sorts of new bad news that are hitting them constantly. I pray you be a buffer around your spirit, man, that it would not cause them to fall or to faint, but they would hold on to you and your promises, knowing if you promise, you can do what you promised. I pray for strength in the inner man. I pray for strong physical bodies. I pray for strong minds. I pray for us to be great parents. I pray that, Lord God, we would parent this next generation, that they would do more for you than we did. And that, Lord, even though we are going through the global pandemic and our children are not able to go and, and go to church as normal, that Lord, we would find a ways, creative ways to cause our children to fall in love with Jesus every day. And we ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay, so that's it for us tonight. We ended a little late. So very sorry. Love you all so much. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Lift his countenance upon you. Be gracious unto you and give you his peace. Amen.